Hi. I'm not sure, I don't think I know all of you, so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm uh, Johan Enqvist. I um, used to be here, I was here for seven years, did my master's and my PhD at SRC. Um, I've been doing a postdoc in uh, Cape Town, University of Cape Town, for the last, since, since January uh, last year. Um, and I'm now about to start a VR-funded postdoc and mobility grant um, with SRC. Or I just started, actually. Um, but I'm still going to be based in Cape Town, and so I'll be here for, for um, yeah, a few months of the year, but, but doing most of the research down there. Um, today I'm going to talk uh, a bit about, um, in general, just the, the drought that happened in Cape Town that I know hits international media, some of you probably heard of. So just give a little story about what happened there, and then also talk about the research that I've been doing um, since I got there. And then a little bit about what's planned for the coming three years for the, for the next postdoc, which also builds on that work. All right, so uh, like I said, I, got the I went to Cape Town last year in January, and kind of this was the Cape Town that I remembered, having been there for the, the PEX conference back in 2015. Uh, so it's like, yeah, Cape Town, beautiful place, cool uh, city to hang out in for a postdoc. Um, but then, of course, I started hearing even before I, before I went, and definitely once I arrived, that this was a city basically like on the verge of panic. Um, there had been a drought for three years um, that was really kind of hitting its peak around uh, the end of 2017, 2018. And day zero was going to, it had been announced to, to come less than 90 days after I arrived. And the day zero would be when they were going to turn off the, the water restrictions were already at 50 liters per person at that point. So you can now use more than 50 liters per day. Um, of course, they couldn't really enforce that. So the, the threat of day zero was that if, you, if people don't comply, we're going to have to shut off all the, all the domestic water taps. Um, and you'll, everyone will have to come collect water at public, public taps. You bring your buckets or your... Or your um, containers and you get 25 liters per day and that would cover everything from drinking to washing to to uh, cleaning and everything uh, so this was obviously a, a very serious uh, threat um, and um, this was reported very widely and, and Cape Town was said to be the first major city that was going to run out of water which by the way wasn't entirely true I think it was the first city on sort of Western radars because of tourism and, and uh, I don't know, wines that people buy from, from the Cape. But um, it, it was a very serious crisis and, and I think uh, a lot of the, the lessons that can be learned from it was, uh, are, are still kind of unique. Um, to give you a bit of background, um, Cape Town and, and Table Mountain, which is a very, very iconic mountain there, uh, has been a very strategic water uh, resource for, for, for a very long time. It's kind of even from uh, before European settlement, uh, the, the San and Khoi Khoi uh, lived there and, and had both, um, were both hunter-gatherers and, and had, um, uh, were pastoralists. pastoralists. Uh, they were pushed out when the Dutch East India Company uh, established a settlement there, which was primarily for um, replenishing their ships with water and, and produce. There were better harbors for the north, but they chose this spot because it had better water. Um, and this is also from where the, the British colonization of Southern Africa kind of uh, didn't start from, but like a lot of the, the expansion started, uh, came from, from this city. It's like, so it's the oldest city of, of uh, South Africa today. Um, water issues was kind of critical part of the, that conflict throughout the expansion and, and uh, colonialism. Um, and even after independence, when kind of the apartheid government took over in 1948, um, water services was a very critical part of the, the segregation that was imposed between the white settlers and, and uh, uh, black South Africans and what's called colored South Africans of, of uh, mixed descent. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the more disadvantaged communities were 
quite uh, explicitly deprived of, of adequate water services. So it's been a conten contentious issue for, for a very long time. Um, and since 1994, obviously, you have democracy and um, this vision of kind of integrating um, all citizens into, into the rainbow nation where everyone has equal opportunity. But obviously, there's a lot of struggle still going on with this. Um, municipalities uh, are tasked with kind of delivering water services. It's, it's written into the Constitution as a human right. So you're supposed to have access to water, but this is still very difficult to, to uh, achieve because of the... Uh, inequalities that still uh, remain from from decades, if not centuries, of, of um, um, segregation and, and discrimination. So what's happened now recently is that from 2015 to 20, uh, 2018, um, when the rains sort of came back, there was a, a very uh, very severe drought. It was the, the driest three-year period that has ever been recorded. Um, so Cape Town relies on these six dams that are located outside of the city and in the, in the mountains. The actual Table Mountain water is not enough to su supply the city now. Uh, it's got over four million people. Um, and the, the sort of research that's been done so far indicates that, the, that climate change has... You can't attribute, of course, a single drought to climate change, but uh, models say that the, the drought was, uh, became three, three times as likely because of, of uh, the effect of climate change. Um, and it's, it's estimated that this type of drought should only happen once every 300 years, but that, of course, will be more common if climate change keeps going the way it is now. Um, but it's also not just uh, an environmental crisis. It's also driven by population growth and... Uh, mismanagement of the catchment areas where the dams get their water. So there's a lot of invasive species uh, and vegetation that is spreading there that has not been cleared uh, as it's supposed to have been, so that's taking up a lot of water. Some estimates say that's between 50 and 80 percent of the water that's supposed to flow into the dams is being um, used up by, by the vegetation instead. Uh, so this picture here is from the, the Tewatersklof Dam, which is the, the largest uh, surface-wise and, and volume-wise the largest dam. And this is what it looked like uh, around the time that I arrived. Um, it's also kind of a little mis, um, misrepresenting the situation because it's a very uh, shallow dam. So obviously there's a lot of surface that looks like it's bone dry, where there's actually more water in other dams that are deeper. But it was a very serious situation. I think by the... Um, it, I think the, the total motor, water uh, supply in the dams dipped just below 20% uh, at the lowest point, which it's more serious than it sounds because the last 10% you can't really use um, because it's basically uh, too much silt and sludge and so on, so it's very difficult to extract from the dams. Um, so this um, kind of tells the story of how it happened. If you can start looking at the, the bottom graph, which shows how much rainfall. 2014 was more or less a normal year, and 2015, 2016, 2017 was gradually sort of worse and worse. Uh, and the top graphs show how the dam levels gradually went, went down. Um, and so the drought itself is really between 2015 to the return of the decent rains in, in 2018, uh, in the winter, uh, June, July. Um, and uh, what happened during this period was that there was restrictions being put in place by the city and, uh, and national government, both on, um, sorry, this is um, on, on urban use and agricultural use, um, more and more so and more severe restrictions towards uh, the end of the period as the, the dam levels failed to, to recover. I think after having two years of droughts, there was this kind of sense that like, well, at, now, at least now, surely rains must come back because it's been bad two years in a row. Of course, that's not really, that's not really how, how climate works. Um, it's just as likely, actually, might even be more likely that you have a th third year drought when there's um, very little um, water to evaporate and, and sort of feed local rain systems. But um, anyway, so there was kind of like this gradual awakening among authorities that this is a very serious issue that can't just be dealt with uh, by conventional measures. The early ones were basically you, you were not allowed to, to water your garden too much or wash your car, whereas towards the end there was these very strict, strict uh, limitations on how much water you use per person every day. 
Um, there was also other sort of measures put in place. There was a water resilience task team created in, in uh, the beginning of, or, or mid-2017. Um, uh, after the 2017 rains had fa failed, um, there was really kind of this sense of the disaster is coming. So the, the disaster plan was announced, uh, the day zero concept was launched, uh, there were tests run for how to distribute this water, uh, having these water uh, distribution sites. So they were, they were trial and tested. That was actually, by the way, the, the first picture you saw on the, on the starting slide with the, the hose pipes. Um, and uh, very much towards the end, actually after I got there in February last year, uh, agriculture was cut off. And that had not happened before. As you kind of see in this lighter, uh, areas here. That's that's the summer, and usually the agriculture was not the agriculture sector hit their um, their allocation by the end of summer, and they're supposed to not get any more water. But as you can see, there's still some water being used after the summer. But 2018 was the first um, summer where they actually cut off agriculture completely, um, and that's a decision that's actually been taken by the national government. And there's a kind of complicated situation where Cape Town and the Western Cape Province is run by the Democratic Alliance, which is the opposition party, and ANC, the um, African National Congress, is running the national government. And there's this conflict between those parties, and there's a lot of accusations that national government was not helping to resolve this local crisis. Um, and also around this time, that's when they finally declared that this was a national uh, disaster. Um, but it was averted. So what you see here is that um, this, the blue line that runs in the center of the graph is actual water use by, by residents and, and the city as a whole. And, and that dropped from about 1,200 um, milliliters per day in the, in the summer of 2015 to less than 500 milliliters per day um, three years later. So that's over 50% over drop from, from the peak level. Uh, which is extremely significant. That is a very, very big drop, and it's very, it hasn't really been documented any, any large-scale examples of that kind of drop without um, enforcing uh, restrictions. So there's no um, rationing or no um, actually cutting off of, of the supplies because they didn't have to do that. Um, so the disaster was averted. It's partly because of the private consumption going down. Um, and it's also because, as I mentioned, the, the restrictions on agriculture were actually affected um, and, and carried out for, for once. Um, there was a lot of work on the sort of technical side, um, repairing leaks, but also reducing the, pr the pressure in the, in the reticulation system. Uh, and there was also some transfer from private dams that, that kind of bought a couple of uh, weeks for, for the city while they were waiting for the, for the rains to return in, in 2018. So this was very great success and everything was, was perfect. Uh, it's also something you figure out when you're looking up memes in the middle of the night. Um, anyway, uh, so C Cape Town is moving to something, something different now. It's not, the situation is not what it's been before. Uh, I think this graph shows quite well what's going on now. The blue line basically traces what the dam levels do in a normal year. So they go down uh, during the summer or after the this starts on the hydrological year. In November, the rains are usually over. So dams go down on the blue line and then come up when the, ra the rains go back. And as you can see here, this is from, from, from this year. Uh, the recovery from the rain is not as, as high as it used to be. It, the, rain, the dams don't go up as much at all. But what you also see is that the, the land levels don't go down as fast as they used to. So people don't, and even this blue line is even modeled, as you see here, on uh, there being restrictions in place. But what people actually use now is much less than, than what's being predicted. So dam levels don't go down as much. So you basically have less water coming in, but also less water, water being taken out. And this is being um, presented as something that's, this is the new Cape Town now. We've, we've learned to, to live with drought. This is a, a new situation and we've adapted, um, which is cool. And, and, that's, and there is actually, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of positive um, things that have been achieved. But this is also just kind of one story of what's going on in Cape Town. Um, the whole day zero narrative was something that's largely primarily affected 
middle income and, and sort of upper class citizens, they were the ones that were really threatened by having to queue for water by, by, um, at taps. There's still 15% uh, of the population live in formal settlements that don't have access to uh, running water in their homes. Uh, what you see here to the left, this is basically population by, uh, I think it's a square 100 meter or something like that. Um, and sort of the center of Cape Town, that beautiful picture that I showed you, that's up there to the left. Where most people actually live is out in townships and informal settlements in what's called the Cape Flats to the, to the right. And also other uh, informal settlements, uh, you basically see the high, the high bars, that's where they're informal settlements. And that's where most people live. The vast majority of the, the population don't live in kind of the uh, fancy nice areas in the middle of the city. Uh, and not everyone there relies on water from, from, from public taps, but generally the water situation is much more uh, problematic there. You have everything from uh, leaking pipes because of this poor infrastructure. This is where um, the apartheid government put all uh, non-whites during um, that era. Uh, with inferior infrastructure and so on. Uh, you have sewers that are being blocked because, the, because of overpopulation. Uh, you have a lot of um, what's called water management devices that have been put on households to control water use, so you don't go ab above a certain level. Uh, if you do, the meter automatically shuts off your water supply. Um, and of course, all of these things keep breaking down. There's not effective ways of, of repairing them and so on. So uh, there's a lot of people that are struggling with water on a day-to-day -day basis already before the crisis. Um, and that might not sort of have this, feel the same sense of urgency for, for dealing with day zero uh, because they're already struggling to meet sort of water service needs um, um, in their daily life even before the crisis. So that's a sort of a quick overview. What I've been doing, uh, the work I've been doing since I got there is basically um, a bunch of different things. First of all, the first thing that sort of came out was this report that I wrote with a colleague of mine on urban green infrastructure, where we looked primarily more on uh, urban heat island effects, and we mapped some challenges related to that. Uh, a lot of what I've talked about now comes from this paper that came out earlier this year, um, which basically was an overview of, of the water governance and justice situation, and we looked at the sort of historical and geographical context uh, of the recent emergencies, not just the drought, but also flooding that is happening a lot, in, in especially in informal settlements. And we've pointed to a few different um, governance challenges related to that. Uh, first of all, that water is not something you can just cut back on. There's still a lot of people that are struggling to get up to a, to a sort of adequate level of, of water supply. Um, there's still a lot of work to, done, to be done promoting sort of cross-sectoral collaboration, which is improving now, but there's still a um, long way to go. Um, and I think very importantly, a lot of the approaches that need to be uh, put in place need to be more inclusive, need to be more focused on building trust between governments and communities, because there's still a very uh, big problem with, with lack of trust. Uh, in what the government is doing, or even in the other direction too, governments don't really trust communities to actively contribute to solving the situation. So there's a kind of a two-way lack of trust there. Um, there's another study that we're just about to publish now, which has looked at how the different responses from the city affected household water behavior. So um, we look specifically at the, the water restrictions, the increased tariffs that were put in place, and this communication campaign around day zero. And basically the main important findings are that um, the, the mechanisms that are not um, basically increasing the cost of you using water, they were more effective than, than the raised prices. So the prices don't really matter so much for, for whether people uh, reduce their, their water use or not. Um, the, the day zero campaign, the green area there, uh, is what affected awareness the most. And, uh, the water restrictions is what, what influenced um, people's propensity to, to save water the most. Whereas the, the yellow areas the, were the, the, the water tariffs that really didn't come out as a strong um, predictor for, for what people, uh, how much people cared about the, the water situation. Um, there's another study I'm doing with uh, uh, Julie Goodness from SRC, uh, where we're following up on a study from her from, that she did uh, a couple of years ago before the, before the drought, where she looked at how um, gardeners in Cape Town, what kind of 
plants and gardening practices they prefer. Uh, and there's some information that came out of that as to what, uh, how, how concerned they are about water. Uh, so we use that to kind of follow up on what people are doing today, uh, one year after the crisis and, and during the crisis as well. Um, and as kind of expected, we see a very sharp decline in, in people using tap water, because you're not allowed to. Uh, but there's a very surprising increase in, in boreholes. Boreholes cost um, over 100,000 rand, which is basically what 60, 70,000 Swedish kroner to install. And they don't really make uh, e economical sense to install. You're not going to save that much money by having a borehole. Uh, but what, there's been some, some, some indication in other studies that people prefer just having the um, safety or security of, of just being self-sufficient. You don't have to rely on the municipality for, rely, uh, for delivering water, which can be um, not very reliable. Um, and we also looked a little bit at how uh, borehole, those that installed boreholes, whether they kind of did that so they could keep their kind of European gardens with rose bushes and very water intensive plants. And we kind of expected that to be like one approach to deal with the crisis and shifting to indigenous species and, and drought resistant ones would be another way. But um, surprisingly, that's not two different approaches. Usually if you install a borehole, you're also very concerned with, or maybe it's just that you have money to shift your, what you have in your garden as well. So borehole uses are actually quite likely to, to have more indigenous and, and uh, uh, drought resistant plants, which is important for, for the local biodiversity, which is very um, unique in this area. So another study we're doing that we're looking at perceptions of fairness. Uh, it's a sort of Q study. We're using Q methodology to look at what people, how people define fairness, basically. And th this is ongoing analysis, but what we're kind of seeing is that some people think that fairness is that pay everyone should pay for themselves and just their own water use. Other things that it's fair that people, that the rich people pay something that goes to cover the cost of the poor. Uh, and others think that fairness should be that the government just pay for everyone. It should be a, a human right. We shouldn't have to pay anything for water. Uh, so just a very important thing to think about if you're trying to reform, uh, first of all, the, the water tariffs, but also just how you think about water and who is responsible for it and, and who has a right to water. Uh, and so, yeah, moving forward, um, this postdoc that I got funded from, from, uh, from VR uh, basically looks, what I want to look at more there is more individual level responses to the drought. So kind of assuming that the drought had a big impact on um, people's water consumption, how long can we expect that effect to last? And, and what happens after one, two, three years? Do people's attitudes and awareness go down or, or continue to grow? Um, it's kind of like these three main, main foci there, uh, studying the water saving behavior and personal and social drivers behind that, and what actual triggers uh, from the, the crisis uh, affected people's uh, change behaviors, and whether that the, these changes refer, revert back to what they were before, whether they persist or whether they kind of develop into something even more, um, yeah, go, going further than what was uh, required during the crisis. People, people keep developing or not, or adapting or not. Um, and what I'm interested in here is basically try to build some theory or, or, or learn more about um, how we can understand pro environment pro-environmental behavior in shocked systems, the kind of the norms, beliefs, and values that underpin that, um, what the lasting effects on awareness is, um, but also kind of people's sense of responsibility and ability to, to act and, and affect change. And those of you who know my PhD work, this ties a lot into kind of the whole idea of care, knowledge, and agency um, in how we deal with, with natural resources around us. Um, and this will be... Um, as the plan is now, quite case study based. So uh, I want to look closer at people that have installed boreholes. Uh, at, we're going to do another follow up of the, the gardening study, uh, how people uh, use their, their what water sources they use um, maybe two years from now when the, when the crisis has gone away. Uh, we're doing a study right now looking more at informal settlements and townships and what water issues uh, are most important there and how people deal with those. Um, and I also want to kind of look at these, what can became known as water warriors, the people that sort of adapted more than everyone else, that cut their water consumption down way below 50 liters per, per day. Uh, what drives their engagement and how does that sort of um, 
uh, change over time? Are they more likely to, to stay on that course or will they uh, give up and go back to something uh, or maybe focus on something else after, after a certain amount of time? Uh, 